is a fine and art photographer. He's based in London and in Dubai. Anthony has, was always motivated to pursue a career in the arts. He attended art college and studied furniture and product design at Nottingham University in the UK. Anthony's photography is based on a minimalist approach that aims to reduce distraction by eliminating objects that sit outside the main subject. The gradual pro process of reduction and deconstruction allows him to capture fleeting moments of the perfect world he's, he'd like to inhabit. A world of simplicity, serenity, and beauty. Join him as he takes you through his journey as a minimalist photographer, Mr. Anthony Lamb. Thank you. So good afternoon. My name is Anthony Lamb, and I'm a fine art photographer based here in the UAE, originally from the UK. I've been taking photography seriously for the last 17 years and professionally for around four years. And today's presentation is going to be about my journey as a minimalist landscape photographer. So let's start with a question. What is minimalism? Well, obviously, as you can see by one of my photographs here, it's all about simplicity. It's all about keeping things to the minimal, losing those distractions. But minimalism actually started as an art movement in the 1940s and 50s in New York. And it was there that some people were producing art, furniture, all kinds of different objects of simplicity. And the Bauhaus movement as well, within Germany throughout the 20s, 30s, and 40s, was also following this same philosophy. People may have seen this quote before. It's quite a common quote now. But back in the 1940s and 30s, when it was originally kind of thought up by Mears van der Rohe, it was actually very new. It was a new idea. Because he felt that simplicity was a way to provoke beauty. So when I was at university at Nottingham Trent in the UK, I came across this guy in about 1999 because I was studying furniture and product design. And because I was studying furniture and product design, I was also in tangent, I was learning about art is history. And if you can see, one of the chairs at the top of this slide is by Mears van der Rohe. It's really simple. If you can imagine a child drawing a chair, it's pretty much that kind of style. And these other pieces, you have an Eileen Gray table, which has symmetry and balance, and then a more recent piece by Philippe Stark which is very organic. It's actually a lemon squeezer, and I actually bought one of these myself, and it isn't really functional. I was squeezing the lemon, most lemon juice went all over my jeans and not into the cup. And that's kind of a distraction, really, of form following form rather than actually being functional. So not everything is going to be functional using this kind of specific kind of design. So why am I talking about design when we're in a photography presentation? Well, actually, this is what laid the foundations for me beginning as a photographer in, in around 2003. And in 2003, I started to invest seriously in some gear. So I bought a camera, some lenses, tripod, etc. And I was heavily influenced by the likes of Ansel Adams, who everybody probably knows, and another gentleman by the name of Michael Kenner, an English minimalist, and also Nick Brandt who is a wildlife photographer, who originally actually was doing music videos for Michael Jackson, believe it or not. So the essence, really, of my work started to kind of come through from dodging and burning. So if you can see this image, it's not simple, it's not minimalist, but it was taken in 2004. And I was experimenting with ways of dodging and burning. I was messing around with the, the dark tone and the light tone within the image and the tonality. And that's where the influence on those three photographers has come from. And I was kind of trying to evoke some kind of emotion through my work, rather than just have a location. I was trying to give people a bit of a feeling as to how that location feels as a photographer or as a person standing there in front of it. So by darkening the shadows and lightening the highlights, what you're effectively doing is you're bringing some kind of emotion 
or connection into that image. And this was taken in 2005. This is where things started to get more linear. So this is when I'm starting to go back to those foundations that were laid by my design background. Because my design background was all about clean lines, linear lines, simplicity, balance, and symmetry. So you start to see this flowing through some of my earlier work. So if you can imagine, I'm st stood on this pier in Derwent Water in the Lake District in the UK. And I'm very keen on going out in conditions that are cloudy, overcast, flat light. And that's still transitioned through to my work to this day. But I'm setting up my camera. I'm looking through the lens, making sure that you've got the tops of those two uh, posts that are in the foreground in line with the horizon and making sure that the symmetry and the leading line is perfectly balanced. And then the ferry pulls in just before I'm about to take the shot. It's like, fair enough, okay. So I have to remove my tripod off the jetty. Morning, everyone's coming past. Thanks very much. But as they're walking past, I notice this young girl with a bucket and she's swinging this bucket and it's got a load of water in it and it's spilling all over the jetty. And I'm thinking, oh, great, because I like clean, simplistic lines. And she's just put this strange, snaky, leading line through the composition. So I set up again, and I level everything up to take the image. A seagull flies in, lands on the post on the right-hand side, and I click the shutter. And I actually get this image back home. And I look at it, and I think, well, actually, do you know what? That adds to the image. That particular line is a leading line. It's actually adding something to the image. And it's not necessarily the kind of work that I'm doing to this day. This is just the f laying the pathway of my journey as a photographer. And I think it's important that you experiment, you kind of try to achieve something that's pushing you out of your comfort zone in order to evolve as a photographer. So this image is actually my first award-winning image in 2005. It won Landscape Photographer of the Year uh, South East for Practical Photography, which was a really well-known magazine in the UK. Unfortunately, that magazine now closed down last year, but it was a very popular magazine. So I was really humbled to win the award. But then I started to ask myself, why did this image win the award? You know, I'd put in a few other images into competitions before, and I'd never won anything. And there was one word, simplicity. And the simplicity within this image is probably what captured the judge's eye. So I started to deconstruct this image and try and work out what it could be that was kind of attracting the judges. And the two chairs are invitation. It's like an invitation to people. So you're walking into the image. You're looking to sit down there with a partner or a friend, kind of gazing out of frame, which then leads you to the leading line of the coast. It takes you up to the wave breaker, which is pointing out towards the burnt out pier in Brighton. So it has a kind of S-curve to it. So it has a leading line which takes you through the composition. And then the texture of the shingle and the tonality of the sky is what brings in the emotion. So I started to think, OK, so mood, simplicity, let's have a bit of a play around. So I started taking some film images. I was looking for more abstract kind of imagery. It's not the greatest of compositions, but it's shot in misty conditions. The fog was coming through a, uh, a plane in the UK called Mentmore. So I was trying to experiment with different light and almost following a more abstract kind of appeal rather than trying to achieve a big vista landscape photograph. So this image was a turning point as well because it didn't just evoke the simplicity that I've been talking to you about, or the mood that I'm trying to encapsulate. It also involves something else, which was kind of like the last jigsaw puzzle to the beginning of my journey as a minimalist. And that was something called non-location specific. And what that means is if you can take a photograph of the Grand Canyon, the Eiffel Tower, Burj Khalifa, we all know, well, most of us know what that location is. We've seen it either on the internet, the news, or we've seen it in, in person. Whereas this image is just a field with a telegraph pole. It could be in America, it could be in Japan, it could be in Australia, it could be anywhere. 
So it's non-location specific. So I started to think a bit more about that and try to work out why it was relevant. So I continued to work, but then something changed. And we all have to pay the bills. And I was still working as a, a, in corporate life in the UK. So I moved with my job from the UK to the UAE in 2011. And the thing is about the UAE, I was living in Dubai. And Dubai is actually a place that is mostly kind of attracted by architecture. So the first thing you see are the huge skyscrapers. And the UAE, I mean, in particular, Abu Dhabi and Dubai, have been trying to sort of build this huge sort of metropolis to obviously attract businesses and people. And as a photographer, it was something that I really kind of bolted onto as soon as I arrived in this country, like many people do. So I started to think of ways of how I could actually approach the city, which is kind of moving away from what I was doing back in Europe. But I was so attracted to it, I wanted to continue. And I was looking at other photographers, and they were rooftopping, they were shooting fog, and they were trying to encapsulate the city above ground. So I started to look the other way and shoot from the ground up. And this was the beginning of a series that I did here in 2012 called Reflective Lands. And Reflective Lands had two connotations. First, obviously, the reflections in lakes, in the sea, or whatever I could find. But also the fact that uh, Sheikh Mohammed went to New York in the 1960s with his family. And they all climbed. Well, they didn't climb. They took the elevator. But they went up the Empire State Building. And they got to the top, they walked into the viewing platform, and they saw the vista or the view from the top of the building. And they were just blown away. So they took that vision back to the UAE, and that was one of the reasons why they decided to build big here. So the, the reflection really is the two connotations. You've got the reflection of the buildings in the water and the reflective or mirror-like idea of the, the fact that the buildings in Dubai were inspired by New York. So I was going to obvious locations. So this is Dubai Marina, still very much location specific, slightly away from what I mentioned. But I was kind of debating, do I put this body of work into the presentation? But I think it's really important because if you think about it and you think back to my design days when I was at university, a lot of the design that I was looking at was very linear, very straight, very, very simplistic lines, very graphic. And that's exactly what these buildings are showing. They're showing that particular story. So I felt I must include that in my journey because it is a kind of pathway that led me to the way I am now as a landscape photographer, which is much more minimal. But this image has a story because I, I had an exhibition and a gentleman came up to me and said, oh, that's photoshopped. And I said, yeah, it is photoshopped. It's dodged and burned. You know, I've used that to increase the tonality. He said, well, I just think the reflection is a composite. And I said, I don't do composites, really. I, I tend to try and capture in camera. I don't tend to add or remove much at all. I try to really encapsulate what is going on in a scene by going somewhere at a specific time of the year or the day. And he said, well, what, how did you make the water look like that? So I said, it's a long exposure. It's about two and a half minutes. So why aren't the boats moving? Well, that's the thing. This is about timing, because if you go to this place in the Dubai Marina, you'll notice that there's always movement. There is boats coming through. There's wind causing waves, etc., on the surface. And there's all these different sort of weather conditions that can affect the way that it looks. But I worked out that if you go in June or July, you go on a Friday morning, and you get there around sort of seven o'clock just after sunrise. There is no wind at that time of the year, and there's also no traffic, no boats, nothing. So you get this mirror-like image on the water. So that was kind of also another area that I wanted to try to continue to use, because it's important as a landscape photographer to actually research, do your kind of groundwork in order to capture something that's going to be meaningful. 
So I continued to take images of the city. After about two years, I got to a point where I was just like, okay, I've kind of been there, I've done that, I've kind of captured the essence of what I set out to do in black and white. And, you know, these are great, these are kind of graphic images. You know, it's all about timing, all about reflections, but it isn't really me, it isn't really what I'm about, which was what I was finding when I was in Europe. I was more interested in the pure element of nature. So, things changed, and one particular day, I woke up to a storm. And I said earlier in the presentation, I said about the weather conditions, that I'm a big fan of flat light and conditions that don't necessarily produce contrast in images. So I wasn't going out at sunrise, I wasn't going out at sunset, I was going out when it was bad weather. Because then I can manipulate the photograph using my own techniques of contrast to then build the story that way. So I went to the desert, and you may think that this is a cat. It looks a bit like a cat, quite a few people have said that. It's actually a dead tree. And this image really was more about the fact that the irony of the real huge storm that was going on over Dubai and the dead tree in the desert. And I took this image and I saw it on the back of my camera and it kind of reminded me straight away of what I was achieving back in earlier, like two or three years ago. And it set off a journey for me, which has now been continued to this day. So I was taking images in the desert. And I'm not sure if anyone's ever been to the desert of the UAE and try to capture it. But I know a few people who have. And the first time I went into the dunes, I was stood there with 360 degree dunes around me with trees, bushes, fauna and fauna everywhere, wondering how to capture this chaos. It's like being in the middle of Times Square in some respect. I think it would be a lot more calming, but actually the desert is a confusing place. There's, there's lines everywhere, it's very difficult to try and compose. So I was looking down the curvature of the crests of the dunes to try and use a leading line. That wasn't working for me because I wanted to try and simplify the work. So I started to use what's called layers by turning the other way. Rather than looking down the dunes this way, I was turning at right angles and shooting across the dunes. And that effectively started to turn the image into a 2D abstract image, which is kind of what my work's all about. It's not about jumping into a huge 3D vista, it's more about giving you a bit of a, the essence of the area and the place. So I also experimented with long exposure, so I went to different locations across the globe, taking long exposures, again, all kind of related to using limited distractions. So as you can see here in some of the images, you've got milky looking water. But it's all still black and white, it's still using techniques of dodging and burning. So nothing really has much moved on. Until I took this image. And this was the start of a project called Sand, which is about five or six years in the making. It finished last year. And this image was taken, and I called it pristine, because there was no footprints, there was no four by four tracks. And you could go to this part of the desert and it was like that. And I just tried it in black and white, and I turned it to black and white, then back to color, and then back to black and white. And I was thinking, if it's in black and white, it looks like snow. It looks like a rolling hills in Tuscany. It could be sand, who knows? But as soon as you flick the color on, your brain tells you straight away, this is sand because you know that that color is related to that element. And that was like a turning point because what it made me think was, well, the more minimal that I'm going with my work, I kind of need the color in order to tell the story because without color, you're losing something. You're losing, I think it's like a fundamental of the actual picture. So I was kind of desaturating the color and changing the hue to try to provide the viewer with just an insight into what the desert is. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to provide you with a slideshow. And the slideshow is of some of the images that I've taken in this project called Sand. And there's actually four different collections within the project. The first one is called Desert Portraits, which is basically the fauna and fauna. So the trees, the bushes, anything that's living within the desert, I've tried to 
obviously capture. Um, the other three um, are just related to the wind and related to the weather and um, the last one, human element, which is obviously the human integration of the desert. But I'm only going to show you one of those in a slideshow, but it's to music. And I want you to try to kind of envisage, because I do a lot of my editing to music, and that, that's really important to me, because it kind of gives me the kind of emotional mood and to be able to capture how I felt when I was taking these shots. So sit back and uh, look at the images, and I'll kind of explain a little bit afterwards, the, uh, you know, after, after the video. Okay, so that's Desert Portraits, the series. And you've probably noticed that a lot of them are very minimalist, very simple. We also have the element of mood or emotion, which I talked about earlier. And also the location or the non-location specific. And those three elements or fundamentals are really what make up my photography. And all of those fundamentals over the years have kind of graduated really to the point where I'm at now. So a lot of my work follows the same kind of route using that particular jigsaw. So if I now just move on to one of the images from that presentation, this is called Sandblasted. So the narrative behind this is obviously I talked about the challenging conditions or the weather and overcast conditions that I tend to go into the desert. And it isn't just the desert, I shoot obviously a lot of seascapes as well, but I was kind of debating, I was sat in my 4x4 
I was debating whether or not to go and shoot this tree because I'd found this tree for the first time in 2018. And I looked at it and I thought, it just has so much character. It's got that kind of personality. And that's the thing about the trees. You don't just find a tree, shoot it, move on, find another tree. You have to try and find certain subjects. So they're a bit like people, because certain people are photogenic and certain people aren't. You can take a thousand pictures of one person and ten could be great, and you could take a thousand pictures of somebody else and have 500 that are amazing. So I find the same that with the subjects that I shoot. Some of them are beautiful and some aren't. And that's how I kind of decide whether or not something has potential. So I'm sat in my car. It's blowing about 40 to 50 mile an hour gusts. The sand is in the atmosphere everywhere. And I'm thinking to myself, is this a good idea? Because if my camera gear is going to get wrecked, I've got contact lenses in, so I might not be able to see anything, even though I wear wraparound glasses. But I kind of persevere and I think, okay, it's, you know, I've got to just do this because you know, that's all about, it's about the fun of doing it. And I'm going to now show you how I kind of visualize taking this shot because I think it's important not just to kind of tell you the journey of how I managed to get here as a minimalist, but also to give you some insight into how I actually construct and deconstruct a location. So if you look at the first dune, I talked about layers. So that's the first layer as such. And what's that, that, what's that providing? It's providing a bit of foreground interest. So you've got a bit of detail in this forward dune. It's also got some darkened shadows, so it's also providing you with a bit of depth. But as you start to add the layers of these dunes, you're effectively creating an unconscious lead in line. So I talked about the S-curve earlier. Amateur photographers, most photographers know the S-curve is a way of drawing the eye through the image. Layering is the same kind of thing. So I use layering a lot. And by using tones within my image, I tend to use that to its advantage. And then you have the subject, which in this case is the tree. And the tree obviously stands out because it's quite symmetrical in terms of its branches. The tree trunk is very straight, and it's also really prominent in the dunes. It's not stuck in the middle of a dune. It's right on top of a dune. And that's important. Because as soon as you start losing those branches in the dunes, then you're going to lose something from the image. Because it's kind of a bit chaotic, then it starts to kind of getting, get lost in the sand. And then the final element would be what's called the negative space. But I call it the positive space, because without it, it's going to be nothing. You know, without the sky, if you go back, it's just nothing. But the sky just kind of brings the whole image together and also, there is cloud, there is texture in this particular sky. So actually, the hues and the different kind of colors in there really do matter. And I put gradients, or I tend to use gradients quite a lot. So I'll bring a gradient into the sky to bring out the texture of the sky. And I'll also maybe put a very subtle gradient on the bottom of my image. And I'll do that quite a lot in my photography. And the reason is because it draws your eye even more into the subject, which is the tree. And these little kind of things might seem simple, but actually trying to take a minimalist shot like this is not as easy as it looks. Because you have to have all these elements of composition and structure and the conditions, the light, everything needs to be right. So even though the simplification is there, it doesn't mean it makes it any easier to do. Um, but that's photography. And the other thing as well is that I've nearly forgot to say there's two trees here on the left hand side. Um, I left those in, but on the print that I sell, those two trees aren't there. And the reason I left those two trees in for the presentation was because I do remove things, but that's about as far as I'll go. I don't tend to remove large things. Okay, twigs, a little bush here and there, maybe a rock or two. I'll clean up the image and remove those distractions, but I won't remove or add a tree, you know, nothing big. Most of this is in camera. It's as the raw file looks, because I think that's got to be part of the story, is the honesty that I'm trying to provide people. I don't want to try and blind people with something. So the next stage for me was to then start producing what's called collections or series. And I use a word called flow. 
And what I mean by flow is that when you have an image, if you want to bunch those images together, then you need to have some kind of collaboration or coordination. So when I talked about reflective lands, which was a different um, series that I did in Dubai about the architecture, there was all kind of flow there because it was related to the reflections and that they were black and white, etc. But if I'd done the same with my previous work in 2004 and five, you would have had a bull, you would have had a shot of Glencoe in Scotland, and then you would have had you know, all these random images, and they don't really kind of collaborate. So in an exhibition or a book, you're going to sort of get a little bit confused. So it's important for me as well, not just to have subject matter that fits together. It has to have some kind of collaboration through composition. It has to have collaboration through the hue and the saturation that I use. So all these things, again, are really important. So when I'm actually doing the editing of my images, I'm usually using one of my other images as a template almost to try and make sure that there is going to be some kind of collaboration. And it happens throughout my work. So I did another series called Paradise Lost, which was set in the Maldives. And I was concentrating on sea level rises um, because I was chatting to one of the guys there on the island and he told me this story about, because he's been living there for maybe about 10, 15 years. And he told me a story about one of the islands and he said, he'd never known so much flooding because what's happening is the sea levels are actually rising. So when the high tide comes, the waves come crashing in, they take away some of the coral, and then they flood the lagoons, which then flood the islands. So it's actually starting to happen. So I wanted to document in 2017 these islands because I don't know how long these pockets of paradise are going to last. You know, I don't know if they're going to be there in 20 years, but I hope they are going to be there. But I don't know. So I was trying to kind of focus on long exposure because that kind of gives you an impression of the time maybe that we have before something drastic might happen or maybe the time that we've got to save them. I don't know. But um, yeah, I think it's important though to build these collections using this technique because you looked at the Desert Portraits collection, they all have a kind of similar flow in relation to their saturation and color. And lastly, I have my most recent project. This is the biggest project I've probably started in my life. It's called Coastal Connections. And I only started it in 2018. But this is, again, about the collaboration between nature and the um, ocean edge, or the sea edge, and man and the coastal edge. And it's how these will be potentially affected but it's also about providing beautiful images of non-location specific places, giving people an idea of what beauty we still have left, just through simplicity. So I'm gonna kind of end this presentation with another slideshow to music um, for you guys just to look through this particular series. It's not finished yet because I hope to go back to these locations once, uh, maybe in 15 years of, or 20 years time, I might go back to all these different locations that I've focused on and see if there's a difference, see if there's any change. I mean, obviously some of this will decay anyway, so there'll be nothing left, but I've starred them all on a map so I know exactly where they are by GPS coordinates. So I'm hoping there is not much of a change um, and that we can continue to see this beauty around the world. So yeah, this next uh, slide, but Obviously, I want to thank everybody for attending today. And uh, this is Coastal Connections.
great stuff. So thanks again for everybody, and also big thanks to Exposure for allowing me to present today. It's been a blast. So uh, really appreciate it, and also um, humbled to be here as an exhibitor. So if anybody's got any questions, feel free to approach me afterwards. I'll be more than happy to uh, answer anything to help you. Thanks again. Thank you again, uh, Anthony. We will take a little break now, and then we will we'll be back with the presentation of uh, Francesco Zizola. So thank you.